So we are very fortunate tonight to have two distinguished graduates from the University of Texas and two very distinguished public servants uh, with us. Uh, Gordon Appleman, at the end of the table here, graduated from the University of Texas in 1959 and then went to a law school in an unknown city in Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> and uh, Julius Glickman, sitting here, uh, graduated in 1962 as an undergrad and then had the very good sense to go to law school here as well, graduating in 1966. Uh, these two men are leaders in our state in many ways and they are model citizens. Um, and I thought we'd start our conversation by asking about the humanities and their careers. Uh, Gordon, you've achieved so much as a lawyer, as a defender of education in our state. Uh, to what extent have meaningful experiences in the humanities uh, affected the way you do your work? Well, um, they, they're, they, perform, they form an essential backdrop to what we do as lawyers. I don't, I don't do trial work. I leave that to, to smart, flamboyant people like Julius. <laughs> but, you know, my practice is, is a more of what I would call a personal one with it's in tax and wills and probate and necessarily part of that is a very close personal relationship where they disclose to me so I can do the work that they ask me to do some very personal things, financial, family relationships and such as that. And so it's real important for me to develop a trust with them. And I believe that the humanities background gives you that kind of training philosophy and ethics and confidentiality and those kinds of uh, principles that you learn in the humanities uh, contribute materially to what I do in establishing my relationship so that I can do that with them. Um, the other thing about the humanities is, is it teaches you to think in all the critical thinking and solving problems. And I frequently hear clients say to me, tell me how to do something, not how not to do it. Right. And that's the problem solving right. element. I think you touched on a, a crucial issue of trust. Uh, and we live in a society today where there seems to be an absence of trust in institutions, in individuals, in traditions. Uh, how do you establish trust? How do you get people to believe you and believe in what you do? Well, you've just got to convince them by, you know, establishing empathy and understanding and asking the right questions and, and delivering uh, the, the right kind of uh, feelings to them so that they know that you care about them. It's not about you. You're trying to gather information from them and you assure them that, that everything is going to be held confidential and used only for their benefit. And that's the only reason for that participating in that conversation. Julius, how do you approach these issues uh, as a trial attorney? How, how have the humanities affected your career? Well, the humanities is central to the law. Uh, lawyers on both sides of the docket all have the same facts, but all facts are not created equal. Mm -hmm. And part of the function of the humanities is to help people understand the significance of the facts and give meaning to what those facts happen to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and. And uh, we, uh, without that, uh, you, have, you have a neutrality, but you bring to bear all the history the, uh, that goes with that, and you can make a decision one way or the other about what ought to happen. I had a uh, case uh, once where a uh, young man was fired because he refused to commit an illegal criminal act. And he was not only just fired, they trumped up a false criminal charge wow. where they wouldn't get the, couldn't get the district attorney in Houston to file it, so they went to an adjacent county. And it was a criminal case, and he said he was sitting in his accounting office one day and two brown-shirted policemen came over, hmm. arrested him, put him in a car, and he said, I didn't, strangest thing, there were no door handles, there was a steel screen in front. And he said, they were talking about the Astros and I was wondering what was gonna happen in my life. And that's the kind of case where, uh, and it turns out, this was because of CE, he, he was fired because he refused 
to falsify a tax return of a CEO who wanted to claim something was a business expense when it was a personal expense. And talking about being a personal relationship, there is nothing like representing somebody when that person is really counting on you in their life or their economic future is in your hands. Well, and you made the point that there are all kinds of facts and different views of facts. It sounds like what you're saying is that much of what one does as a lawyer or a professional in any setting is tell a story. That's How do you learn to tell a story? Well, that's, uh, and I'm not sure I can tell you how I learned it. Uh, maybe I never have, but... It, You're pretty good at it, actually. <laughs> <I think. laughs> but uh, it, it is, you tell that story, but, and, and that's where the humanities comes in. Because if, if you don't have some context of history, of literature, uh, of psychology, all the things that the humanities stand for. You can't make sense out of what's happening in a lawsuit or life or much of anything else that you do. But it's the human, I, it's like, a, uh, we didn't talk about this, but it's like you have a coloring book <laughs> and you don't have any before it's colored, there's nothing there. Right. But when it's colored, you get the art and you understand the picture. And what the humanities does is color in life and it gives us meaning to what we do. I love that phrase, coloring in life. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, one of the phrases that's often used as well is that uh, youth is lost on the young. Right, and many students go through university not necessarily appreciating what what they have. Uh, you both have been very successful and have come back to the university. You're so involved in the university community. What do you wish you had known uh, when you were when you were a student? Uh, if you can remember that far back, Gordon, what do you wish you had known? I don't know, Jeremy. I can't think that far back, so I have no answer to the question. I, you know, I, uh, I, I. I I wouldn't have, I don't think I'd have done anything different. I, I took the courses that I needed to go in the direction they wanted to go, but necessarily in my thinking at the time and what I would tell the students now is, is that, that the undergraduate is the time for a testing, for experimenting, right. for experiencing different things and testing them like a laboratory and de determining what your interests really are, immersing yourself uh, not only deeply in a subject, but also in many different subjects so that you can be sure that what you think is what you're interested in is truly what you're interested in. You're interested in learning universal skills like how to think and how to research right. and how to, how to determine values and things that you'll use uh, later in life, how to communicate effectively, etc. So um, I don't know if I knew it then or I don't know it now, but it's, it's something that ought to be done. Right. There's an argument for the liberal arts and an argument for exploration. Well, that's right. where you get it. Right. Julius, what do you, what do you think? Well, I, um, I think that uh, it's the same thing. When I, I came to the University of Texas because of a high school, of course, in Big Spring, once I graduated from there, there really wasn't anything left to learn. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, uh, well, there were only two of you there, right? Well, <laughs> <laughs> there were four. Of oh, us, so. excuse me. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, we, we, you get to the University of Texas, and uh, uh, we had a uh, uh, Rita Wig. She taught English in Big Spring High School, and she uh, was a graduate. Phi Beta Kappa graduate from the University of Texas in Greek and Latin. And she was the hardest teacher I ever had and the best, one of the mm -hmm. best ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told her I was thinking about going to some different schools. I was almost going to go to Juilliard and play the clarinet, but uh, decided to go to the University of Texas and all my friends were going somewhere else. And. Uh, she said, Julius, you can go to these other places and you'll do well. But if you go to the University of Texas and do well, you will know you have achieved something. And, and that's what the university can do. And it's the people, it's the courses, it's the professors. 
And uh, for me, it was a great learning experience. And uh, I went there knowing four people. All my other friends were gone elsewhere. But it is the place where you can learn. And uh, I can't think of any better place I could have mm -hmm. gone. That's mm -hmm. yeah, a great place. You know, Jeremy, the proof of the value of the College of Humanities is they took an average guy from Big Spring and made him a superstar. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. That's great. Don't try this That's at home, great. kids, yeah, right? right. <laughs> So one of the things that's extraordinary about the two of you is not only uh, where you came from, but what you became. Uh, we've been blessed uh, as, America, as a society, I think historians would agree, by some extraordinary leaders in the last 40 to 50 years. And one of the questions many of us ask is, what will the leaders of the future look like? What are the things you think that future leaders need to know and need to learn, and how do we prepare future leaders, because uh, as much as you want to hold on forever, at some point you're going to have to let go, right? So how are we going to train the future Julius Glickmans and Gordon Appelmans? Julius? Well, I think, uh, I think they'd be better off following Gordon's example than mine. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I think, uh, and, and I think, I think you find people who believe that they're, believe in education and believe in a lot of the value. One of the great things about the humanities is it embodies the values of this country. And it makes, it's the kind of thing that's made us unique and we're not guaranteed this in perpetuity. Right. And uh, I think we need to figure out what is to bring them, keep this campus a great university and in spite of certain people we have now who are determined to make it less than a great university, we have to fight for it. And I will say this, it's people like Gordon who have done so well with the uh, Coalition for Excellence that has kept us in the ballpark. And everybody needs to take a part in doing that. So uh, I think we just create the environment where people learn to think, learn to evaluate, learn to put things in perspective, uh, and, and uh, are inquisitive, and I think that's where you get your leaders. Excellent. Gordon? Um, my starting point is to define a leader, and uh, for lack of a better example, it's to find somebody that has the courage to take a leadership position, to risk failure, and to go ahead and take that lead to cause other people to follow their beliefs. And the responsibility for the rest of the people is what the humanities teaches, and that's to learn what's worth fighting for, mm -hmm. what the values are, what are the mm -hmm. lasting values, not the temporary values, not the, not the monetary values, but the real, true life values. And a current example is, uh, came from Malala, the, 19, the 2014 teenage Nobel Prize winner who said, was asked, you know, what, what is the solution to all our world problems? And she said, education. She said, it's learning about liberty and it's learning about justice and it's learning about respect and it's learning about accepting the different value differences. Mm -hmm. And that's what we teach, and that's what the humanities teach. Mm -hmm. That's philosophy, that's history, that's literature. You don't have to, like they said in the earlier lectures, you don't have to experience that all yourself when you do the humanities. Mm -hmm. You learn it from somebody else's experience and you test it. You test it under today's circumstances. That to me is what we need to do for leadership in the future is just to cultivate these people. And this is the perfect atmosphere to do it. Mm -hmm. How do we get beyond the, the partisanship that seems to get in the way and the politics that seem to get in the way? Well, necessarily you're going to have different views. And my reference to value judgment will weed out the ones that... Disagree with you. Disagree with me. Yeah. And, <laughs> and let me add, there's a lot of those people. Right? So we're not counting heads. <laughs> <laughs> Julius, what do you think? I mean, we have to think deeply about these issues, but it can't be just about, you know, one point of view or another. How do we bring in a more diverse range of views? Well, I think, uh, I think if you're an educate, if you have a good education, you realize that people have different opinions 
and that there are going to be differences of opinion. And in this country before, we have always treasured diversity and we've profited from different points of view. So that's nothing to be afraid of. But what, we wor what worries pe me is that, that you've got to have that courage. I'm not sure where you get that, but you've got to have the courage and the determination to stand up mm. when things are going on and, uh, uh, and make sure that your voice is heard. And uh, because uh, there are a lot of people that would like to take over and a lot of people who don't, you know, we, we're, we think about education, but we don't believe in it when it comes to putting our money is where our where our mouth is our money right now we have cut education and expected more from it and when we try to get appropriations we can't get the appropriations mm -hmm. and then we try to raise tuition we ask to do more as a university if you can't raise the money to do it you can't fund education and in fact, if you look at the history of what's happened in the last 30 years, the percentage of money going to education has gone down every year, most every year. And yet what, and this number, uh, uh, so how can we do more on less? And we have to say, education is worthwhile and we need to pay for it. The, the problem, I think, right, is that a lot of people will look at that and say, well, if we're going to educate people for the future, to be the few, future Julius Glickmans and Gordon Appelmans, we should educate them with a specific skill and focus on skill development rather than the airy-fairy world of literature. Uh, history's not airy-fairy, let me tell you that, but <laughs> literature and other fields. Um, how, how should, obviously you don't agree with that, uh, what's your response to those who say, well, yes, let's put more money into education, but let's put it into vocational training. Let's put it into preparing people to do a specific job for which we know there's demand tomorrow, which usually is not philosophy or literature. How, what's your response to that, Gordon? Well, let, let me say this to the previous question. We welcome dissent. Dissent brings out the best, and it, it, it's the challenge of ideas and the, the compromise and the back and forth that produces even better ideas, so having dissent is not a problem. But as to the current reformers, um, that's a very short-sighted view. Uh, and, and so what, what they want to do, for them the bottom line is the bottom line. It's the quarterly P&L statement. It's not the long-term vision, it's not the creating the basic knowledge from which future developments are, are created. Um, the humanities produces, you know, the, the, what, what is the common question is, is well, what are you going to do with that degree? And the answer to the question is, it's not what I'm going to do with that degree, it's what I can do. Mm -hmm. And what I can do is I can address all the changes that inevitably happen in society. You can be trained for job A and job A may be gone by the time you get out of college. Right, right. So you've got to develop the skills to adapt to create new things to think about the problems and solve the problems. Uh, it, it's the long-term view. And right. besides that, the other aspect of that is not just the economic view, but the life view. Yeah. And that is, how do you live a good life? What, 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 when the end comes, are you satisfied with having done, with pursuing your own passions, and with what are you satisfied? And you can't do that just by dollars. You've got to do that by satisfying yourself, finding what you want to do, and, and doing it to the best of your ability. Right. And that's, that's an important issue I want us to come back to, but before we get to the life issues, I think this issue of what the skills are, what people are being prepared for is important. And what I hear you saying is that we're not preparing people for tomorrow, we're preparing them for a lifetime of learning, for a lifetime of adaptation, for a lifetime of creativity. Julius, what, what's your perspective on this? Well, I, we, I think as a lawyer, just knowing the law is not enough. Uh, like knowing the facts is not enough. What is the significance of what you do? And uh, it, life is not just about earning a living, it's m about earn making a life that is worth living and, and all the things that go with that right. and giving. Where do you get judgment? 
where do you get reason? Uh, we, education is not about educating just people to make a living. It's teaching you to think, to reason, to examine, and decide what is the right thing to do in so many areas mm. of life. Mm. And we're pretty sterile if all we can, our life is about is that we want to go out and make money, although I'm not against that. <laughs> Well, there's a wonderful way of thinking about this, right? You can't imagine a civilization without art, but art also needs money, yes. right? The two, the two, go, hand, the two right. go hand in hand. So let's get to this issue of living a good life. Um, my, my children are tired of hearing me use the I word, the integrity world, word. But I think in the end, when we look back on our lives and the lives of other people who we revere, it's usually their integrity that defines them, not their checkbook balance, not even the title they had, but the way they lived their lives, the judgment they showed, the integrity when confronting temptations of different kinds. How in your careers, where I know you've been confronted with all kinds of temptations, how have you maintained your moral balance? How have you defined your integrity? Where did that come from? Uh, Gordon, let's start with you. That I, I, I don't know where it started. It's just always been there, and it's, it's what the humanities teaches. I mean, it, it, it's basic to good citizenship. It's basic to uh, a decent person. I, I just can't imagine the other, although I've seen it. Uh, and I, but I can't rationalize g getting there. And so, you know, you, your courses teach it. Philosophy teaches it, and all the ethics courses teach it. Uh, and and then you're rewarded for it, and you see other people rewarded for it, and you want to duplicate it. I one of the four plaques that's out here in the in the rotunda to Walter Cronkite. One of the four things for which he is most revered was his integrity yeah. and his courage. And so uh, it, it, it's 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 valued by the society, and it's it's repeated by those who who want to have uh, a. Uh, productive life. Have you had models in your life? Well, my father was one, uh, you know, and then there's all kinds of historical figures, but, uh, but uh, yeah, the family was, you, you, that, that's what I said, I just grew up with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Julius? Well, as for temptation, I can resist anything but temptation. <laughs> uh, uh, but the, uh, I think the models of integrity, to me, Integrity is almost self-executing, and I don't know where you get that, but life is pretty empty, and the people that I do admire are those that have their ideals and stay with them. And one of the things that's great about this, I remember one of the first times, uh, I've seen it several times, but Paige Keaton, who was dean of our law school, and uh, Paige was a great man, he, he once was talking to, when I first got up here, he said, uh, he said, he was talking to a group and uh, he said that uh, one student said, Dean, I have a strong sense of justice and I fight for what is right and I deplore that which is wrong. Do you think I would be a good lawyer? And Dean Keaton said, no, son, I think you ought to be Batman. <laughs> 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 but but beneath that veneer was a man who stood for something. And if your life is going to mean anything, you have to stand for something. And Paige Keaton, there was once a lawyer here that uh, was trying to get a job in one of the big law firms in Houston, Texas. And uh, he was Jewish. None of the law firms would hire him. And this had been going on for a long time. Paige Keaton called in his deans and said, you tell those firms that if they don't do something about this now, they will never get another law student interview with them from the University of Texas. Mm. Now, I don't know where you get your, your ideals, but Paige Keaton is one of mine. And if I'm going to live a life, that's the kind of life I want to have. A friend of mine just uh, took his life expectancy and said, 
under the standard mortality tables, he had 13 years to live. And he said when he found that out, what Vladimir Putin was doing in Crimea, it didn't seem to matter that much. <laughs> and I said, well, what does? Well, integrity is one of those. Yeah, well, I, I'm reminded listening to, to both of you of all the things you've achieved, but fundamentally, I think uh, Leo Tolstoy figured it all out, right? He said that in the end, human beings are judged by their humility, not simply by their skills or their achievements, right? That it's the recognition of how little we control and our effort to respond to a world around us and just do a little bit good. And I think at the, at the basis, the humanities are about that. And I think you gentlemen have done more than just a little bit good. But you've taken the humanities as a model for all of us, and I hope many other people will be inspired by you. Thank you for spending this evening with us. Yeah, thank you.